All right, welcome everybody on this rainy night. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank people. There's always people to thank, and that's because a lot of people pitch in to make these things happy, happen. <clears throat> Town of Springdale, first of all, this is really their, they gave us the money, they're giving us this facility, they offered the cameras, Ryan is staying late to do all this. Robin did, did the posters. You know, this is this is really a Springdale uh, Zion Canyon Mesa affair. So thank you, Town of Springdale. Spring Hill Suites have given that's a nice room, huh? And you got and the breakfast isn't horrible. Those those hotel breakfasts in the morning, they've got the best one. That's you know you make your own waffle. So Spring Hill Suites, which is also the Holiday Inn Express and the Hampton Inn, Fit and Spur gave us meals tonight. And SUU, uh, through Danielle here, uh, she gave a, a Dr. Nalini Nakardi, not Carney, gave the convocation there uh, yesterday. And this is a pattern that we're hoping to work. Uh, Danielle Dubrowski, um, what's your official title up there? I'm the director of the Facebook and Center. It's a wonderful center, the Center for Human Values, and they're going to get wonderful speakers down there, and we're hoping to sort of they pay the thousands to get them down here and we pay the hundreds to get them here from, from there. So we're very grateful and we hope to keep that pipeline going. So thank you, Danielle. Um, we're the Zion Canyon Mesa and uh, we are a nation's arts and humanities residency. And I think the easiest thing for me to do is just say, go to zioncanyonmesa.org, hit that donate button. I mean, and then check out our podcasts, uh, we've got, uh, there's more lectures coming up next week with uh, Simons Bunton. He's the founder and editor for terrain.org, the first and arguably still the most influential online uh, environmental um, online magazine. He'll be here next Saturday. So tonight with Dr. Nalini Nadkarni, we're talking about disturbance and recovery and what a well-timed topic. We just had dinner together and we were talking about looking, comparing human ecosystems that are damaged and how they get repaired and, and forest systems and other natural systems. And as we all know, um, in the last couple of days, we have been in quite a, a cycle of disturbance, starting back with the incredibly polarized politics that we're all wrestling with, then COVID, and as you start to funnel in, these forces that are tugging at our national fabric are also evident here in our small communities. We feel those same forces here. We, we are responding to those same issues. And in terms of loss, very recently, we, we lost three incredible elders of our community, Mavis Madsen, uh, Warda, and, and Leon Lewis. And those are people, those are our General Shermans, those trees that you cannot replace. And as times are moving so fast, they represent a time that, that no longer exists and they don't, they don't make people like that anymore. And the community that they grew up in doesn't exist anymore. And to bring it right down to the last few days where somehow uh, we experienced one of those news items that you only read in the papers and wonder about those poor people with the crazy shooter running around in their town or their school. Uh, my wife, Angie's a teacher. She went from doing, uh, she had to do shooter, active shooter drills in her school. Who could have imagined that? Some of you old timers remember when everybody drove around with rifles on their truck racks and brought guns to schools for hunting afterwards. Those days are gone. So I wanna say that three o'clock tomorrow at the Rockville Community Center, uh, some of the officers will be there and we'll be specifically talking about the events of the shooting. All right, so if you wanna talk about that, hear exactly what happened and express your feelings or try to vent a little bit, which I, my wife and I are kind of in the middle of this one on a lot of levels. So, uh, but the point I wanna make about that is, is what, what kind of damaged soil has emerged even in our small local community that somehow a man who was up for two counts of first degree murder, tried to burn his house down with his wife in it, was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon and aggravated assault, 
how is it that a man like that can live in our community illegally for three years? And how did it end like this? It's not okay. Uh, there's a lot of sh shook up people in Rockville. I know grandmothers who had their shotguns loaded in their, in their closets with their grandchildren. That's not okay. And it should never come to that. And it came to that right here. So that this idea of disturbance is hitting home right here, right now. What Dr. Nadkarni and I were talking about at dinner along with some other folks from our board. And back there is Linda Newell. She was the founding member of Zion Canyon Mesa. Where even there was, and our previous chair. So we were talking about, okay, how do you work through disturbances like this? How do you recover? How, what does nature have to teach us about how you move on? How do you ask the right questions about what happened? How do you implement the answers that you found? Uh, and we had a rollicking conversation at dinner and I expected just to continue through right through this, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, very briefly, Dr. Nod Carney, Ah, is amazing. Maybe I should just leave it at that. I had a, there's, there's all the cool stuff that she's done and she is. Uh, lifelong interest in trees, right? And that leads to her, uh, this photo of her zipping around the, uh, the rainforest of, of both uh, the Olympics and Costa Rica. She is a rainforest ecologist, a Guggenheim fo uh, fellow, a faculty member at Evergreen, we have an evergreen graduate uh, right here with us, David Hatfield. Um, and in 2011, joined the University of Utah as a professor of biology and director of the Center for Science and Mathematics Education. She received her, her bachelor's at Brown and her PhD from the University of Washington. She's got a big list of awards here. I'll just hit the top ones. There's, there's a Guggenheim, there's Aldo, uh, Aldo Leopold, Nash. Oh my God, I just make a bunch of stuff up. She's got so many awards, a car medal, uh, she's deeply interested in public engagement of science. And what she's, what has led her here today with us is that she started to look at human systems, even from highways and building and natural systems. What happens when they're disrupted? How are they put back together? What are the similarities? What can we, what can they learn from each other? Without further ado, Dr. Nalini Nadkarni. <laughs> Thank you everybody for making this possible. I'm just so excited to be down here. My husband and I have visited your beautiful national park of Zion and treasure that, that wonderful resource. Um, but I really have learned about other resources here in Southern Utah, having spent a couple of days um, with Danielle at um, Southern Utah University and now here at your beautiful community center and this incredible thing that's being built right up the hill from here, um, which I hope to visit um, when, it's, when it's ready for people to come by and, and speak. Um, Logan's introduction um, really, I think, makes us think about disturbance and how we might recover from disturbances. And he made me aware of the incident that happened a couple of days ago that really has shaken this community, I can imagine. Um, I'm not living here, so I don't know the depth of it, but I have a great compassion and sympathy for all of what you must be going through. And so I thought I would share with you a poem in this book that I wrote about trees. It's by Wendell Berry, whom probably many of you know as an incredible writer about nature. And it, to me, it's a poem that speaks about both darkness and light and about how we might find light when there is darkness. So as a sort of almost a benediction or an introduction, I'd like to start my lecture with this poem. It's called Woods. I part the outthrusting branches and come in beneath the blessed and blessing trees. Though I am silent, there is singing around me. Though I am dark, there is vision around me. Though I am heavy, there is flight around me. And so with that, I would really like to just begin kind of a lecture slash discussion with all of you about the nature of disturbance and recovery. And I'd like to share with you some of the precepts, some of the themes about disturbance and recovery that I have sort of encountered as a forest ecologist who's deeply interested in the intact primary forests that we find in tropical and temperate rainforests, which I've been studying for the past 40 years from the perspective of the forest canopy. I climb trees and get up into the, the forest treetops and study the plants and animals that live there, but also being aware of the disturbances, both natural and human caused, that, that are impacting in sometimes negative ways of the rainforest that we treasure and that we, we know we must protect. 
And so what I'd like to do is to talk about several things tonight. Um, one of them is, uh, and I titled this Transdisciplinary Tales of Disturbance and Recovery, because I think understanding something as complex as the sporadic, unpredictable, and yet ubiquitous forces and processes of disturbances in our lives and on our planet, and the recovery from those disturbances really requires more than one lens to look through. And so I'm going to share with you some of the lenses that I've been able to share um, with people from other disciplines and to see how we might encounter and understand disturbances. Um, I wanted to first simply define disturbance. Um, and there are lots of definitions. Uh, it's an interruption of a state of peace, quiet or calm, an interference, uh, with or alteration of uh, a planned or ordered or usual procedure, state or habit, a departure from a normal standard, a deviation, disruption or impairment in the form, function or activity, an outbreak of disorder, a breach of public peace. And so when you read that definition, you know, there's kind of a lot going on there in terms of, you know, kind of negative consequences. But one of the things that I'd like to point out and maybe draw out as we talk about disturbance and recovery, are the fact that although we tend to think of disturbances with our terms, our language, a catastrophic forest fire, a, 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 a you know, a, a devastating flood, all of these, these words that we put on disturbances, there may also be opportunities for positive outcomes um, that we can consider too. And so what I'd like to do is, is to talk to you about and share with you some of the precepts and themes that I've been able to think about and learn about from my own field of forest ecology, but also other disciplines that deal with disturbance and recovery, and to think about how we can understand this in nature, but also how we might understand this uh, in terms of human society and even the human body. So um, I don't wanna make this uh, just all about me and my studies and my experiences. I wanna share them with you and think about how we can all think more collectively about disturbance. And so what I'd like to do is to just take a moment for each of you to think about a disturbance that might've happened in your life, might've happened here in Springdale, might be what, what Logan has already mentioned already with the shooter incident, or it might be something in your personal lives or your professional lives. And just take a moment to think about one particular disturbance. And, and with thinking about that disturbance, um, I'd like you to hold that in your mind as I go through some of these themes that I've gotten from other disciplines and think about how your disturbance might benefit from those insights from other disciplines. So if you can take a minute to think about and identify a particular disturbance in your life, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor, someone you might know, seems like everybody knows everybody around here, um, or somebody you don't know, and just share in a minute or two what that disturbance is. Great. So I hope that each of you, and, and we can talk, we're going to have another opportunity to talk more about this, but if each of you has in your own mind the disturbance that you chose to identify as something that that you know, that you experienced, and now you've also got the experience or the knowledge of somebody else's disturbance. So, so I invite you to just sort of keep that in mind as I go through some of these ideas. And what I'd like to do next is to tell you a little bit about my approach and my sort of history with disturbance and recovery, um, starting first with the standpoint of forest ecology. So as I mentioned, I studied rainforests in Costa Rica and in Washington state. I chose to study the forest canopy because until about 30 years ago, it was basically not understood scientifically at all. But thanks to having lots of mountain climbing techniques, we use construction cranes, we use hot air balloons to understand and get access to the forest canopy. We've come to understand the organisms that live in forest canopies, interact with each other, and really create this sort of tapestry of interactions and species that are really rarely understood or seen even from the forest floor. So there's a huge diversity of animals that live in the forest canopy. My own particular research has been about the plants that live in the forest canopy, the mosses, the bromeliads, the orchids, the ferns, and just this fabulous diversity of plants that are not only just existing up there, but also interact with the forest as a whole. They capture nutrients from rain and mist. They keep those nutrients up in the canopy for some period of time. And when those branches fall, when the trees fall, when the epiphyte or these canopy plants fall, they die and decompose and they contribute their nutrients to the forest as a whole. These plants also contribute food, nectar, energy resources for birds and arboreal mammals. So what we've been able to establish is that in primary forests, that is forests that are intact, that haven't sustained damage from human activities like agriculture, 
climate change, we understand that these intact bars are really great at maintaining these complex interactions within them. But we also know that there are lots of disturbances that are going on now in tropical rainforest ecosystems. Climate change is affecting forests, deforestation, forest fragmentation, invasive species are all creating disturbances in this fabric, this tapestry of intact forests. And one of the phenomena that I've been very interested in is trying to understand the effects of clearing of forests where farmers will leave a few trees or sometimes just a single tree, what we call a relic tree in the middle of a pasture. Now, why do they do that? Why don't they just clear the whole darn pasture? Well, they value these individual trees for shade for their cows. Sometimes they, they create medicinal uh, uh, plants that they can, they can use, fruits. Some farmers say, well, I just think it's beautiful to have a, 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 an extra tree out there. So for whatever reason, these relic trees are maintained in many of the pastures that are created in the tropics. And one of the questions I had was whether or not these relic trees, these remaining solitary isolated trees can actually function to speed the recovery of that pasture after it's been used. That is, can they serve as, as sort of nuclei, what are called regeneration nuclei, where birds will, will fly across that ocean of pasture to this island of a single tree and pollinate that tree or disperse its fruits and we really don't know whether these trees actually function in some sort of a recovery type um, situation. And so I've been doing research on these trees, um, these relic trees and pastures for some time. And actually it was in the course of doing some research on these relic trees that I had a really bad disturbance. I fell out of a tree when I was doing this research. This was in the Olympic National Park. I fell about 50 feet. Um, None of the branches intervened to sort of stop my fall. Um, and I sustained a lot of injuries. I was medevaced out. My graduate students who happened to be there with me called in a helicopter. I was taken to the Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Um, I sustained a bunch of broken ribs, a burst vertebrae, fractured pelvis, broken uh, fibula. I lost my spleen. I lacerated my lung. I had a uh, traumatic brain injury. I cracked my second uh, cervical vertebrae. Um, so it was not a very good scene. Um, and I was really terrified that I was going to be somebody else, that this disturbance, this physical disturbance was going to profoundly affect my life and not allow me to consider, continue my work as a professor, as a mother, as a wife, as someone who loves skiing, as someone who loves turning wooden bowls. What was, would I be? And I knew that in my previous life, that is the life that I had lived up until then, this stable, regular life that happened without disturbances. I was, I am a family member. I am a wife. I bring science to prisons. I go out to the field for months at a time. I climb trees. I give talks. I give presentations. But I knew that I would have to ask the question, which is, who will I be after this disturbance? Well, happily, I'll just give you the short story. I was able to get great medical care. I had wonderful support from my friends and family. After a year, I was able to go hiking again, go running again. And after two years, I'm able to go tree climbing again in my field sites. So I was really, really happy that I was able to recover from this disturbance. There are still minor changes, but I was very fortunate. And I asked myself the question of, what were the elements that promoted my recovery? Now, I was 64 years old when I fell out of this tree. And so nobody expected me to make any sort of recovery at all. And I've become sort of the poster child of, of, uh, you know, of, of medical trauma because, um, because I did make such a good recovery. Um, but I, I, one of the reasons I think that I recovered well was because the year previous to that disturbance, to that 50 foot fall from the tree, I had convened what I called a transdisciplinary colloquium. I was thinking about, well, if I can't answer forest ecological questions just using theory and practices to understand these relic trees, maybe other fields would have answers to how relic trees might facilitate recovery. So for example, I was thinking, well, if you have a matrix of healthy forest and you have a clear cut in that forest, a disturbance, a physical disturbance of that forest, might that be something like a burn a disturbance in the healthy matrix of flesh of your hand? Might there be precepts in burn trauma that I could relate to trauma in a forest ecosystem that might be useful to me? Well, 
if you're an academic in a wonderful university like the University of Utah or Southern Utah University, uh, there are lots of, of experts in other fields that you can call on the phone, you can contact and say, what do you do when you want an answer to a, a question in your field? So we have a wonderful website feature called Find a Researcher at the University of Utah. And I typed in the words disturbance and recovery and boom, out came a list of faculty from all over campus, from all these different disciplines, of forest ecology, of modern dance, traffic engineering, urban planning, human development, refugee studies, people who actually study the phenomenon of disturbance and recovery in their fields. And so I called each of them up and I said, would you be interested in joining me in a colloquium to see if we can figure out what sorts of models and theories and processes and practices and tools we might be able to share to answer this question of how relic structures and systems encounter disturbance and recover from them. And so we spent two hours a month meeting in the Marriott Library, our wonderful library, and we just posed this question to each other. In the first semester, each of us in these different specialties talked about, gave a lecture about how in forest engineering, in traffic engineering, for example, they study disturbance and recovery. How do they understand how traffic jams happen? How do they resolve and mitigate the disturbance of a traffic jam? Uh, in human development, what happens when a child loses a parent? How does that affect, how does that disturbance affect the recovery of that young child? So each of us gave a two hour lecture about how we deal with disturbance and recovery in our field. And then during the second semester, we began talking about what we called emergent themes, themes that were common to one or more of our disciplines. And what I'd like to do is to share with you four of the themes that we sort of pulled out of each other's exchange of information about disturbance and recovery. So for example, one of these uh, was the consequences of disturbance. And at first we were all thinking about the negative consequences, like those definitions that I read to you. Um, and so I talked as a forest ecologist, I talked about forest fires, the smoke they breathe, the, you know, the problems that come with forest fires, the loss of these, of these forests and so forth. Um, but we also talked about potential positive consequences of disturbance. And in fact, the woman who studies refugees and refugee populations, which are populations that are displaced or disturbed from their original country, for example, a family that moves from Somalia or South Sudan and comes here to Salt or comes here to Utah, Salt Lake City, where we have a very large refugee population, said, you know, it's true. Yes, there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of disturbance. There are a lot of negative consequences when families are displaced from one country to another. They lose their cultural ties. They lose their access to their families and their villages. But the young women have access to education. And so for that part of the family, that's actually something that came out as a positive result, a positive consequence of what seemed like a totally negative disturbance. And then the artist among us, the modern dancer said, wait a minute, you guys, all I'm hearing about are these negative consequences of disturbance. I think you have it all wrong. For artists, we require disturbance to create new art forms. And our modern dance faculty member said, you know, if it weren't for the disturbance of modern dance by people like Martha Graham and so forth, I'd still be dancing ballet. But instead, there was a disturbance. There was a reaction against ballet and that allowed the forms of modern dance and avant-garde dance to emerge. And so that was a really interesting insight and all of us in the other disciplines began sort of scratching our heads and thinking about the positive aspects, the potential positive aspects of disturbance. Well, a second precept or theme was that um, knowledge enhances recovery. And our traffic engineer was very adamant about this one. And he said, you know, we have gigabytes, megabytes of data. We get data from all kinds of sources. We interview drivers. We get all this sort of automated uh, and sensor information about traffics. So we have a lot of data about what causes traffic jams and what can mitigate them. And so he said, one of the things that we must do as traffic engineers is to collect and analyze and apply those data in order to mitigate the disturbances that occur in our system. And that was very interesting to me as I was recovering and thinking back to this colloquium when I was in the ICU, the intensive care unit, I was having ICU psychosis, I was seeing hallucinations, I was convinced that my nurses were giving me poisons instead of medication. 
But this is, this is a property that happens if any of you have ever been in the ICU. This happens when you have these pain killing drugs where you don't have daylight and night light when you're in pain and so forth. And it, it very rapidly stops as soon as you get out of the ICU. So when I was so terrified that I was losing my mind, I, I couldn't depend on my own mental capacity. And I was very, very frightened about that. The doctors and nurses assured me that this was a temporary passing thing. And that when I got out of the ICU, I would not be suffering from these, these mental aberrations. And so that knowledge that, that this would not last forever was extremely comforting to me and reduced my stress and my anxiety and allowed me to heal much better. So knowledge enhancing recovery, I think, is another really important theme that came out of this colloquium. A third precept was the importance of the web of relationships. And so this is certainly true with these little relic trees that you see here, that they require the web of relationships of birds that can fly from the, the residual primary forest, cross that ocean of pasture in order to pollinate and disperse the fruits of those isolated trees. And so just as I felt isolated by myself, I you know, was worried about my identity and what I could do, I recognized that I needed a, a web of relationships as well. This was reinforced by our faculty member in human development. What he told us was in terms of attachment theory, which is a psychological theory that states, if a child loses a child, if a, if a child loses a parent due to death or divorce, very often they, in their adult life, they experience a lot of problems with, with building trustful relationships. But if there's a web of relationships where a family member, an uncle or a grandparent can come in and serve the function of a parent, those negative consequences of the disturbance of losing a parent can actually be mitigated and trusting relationships can be formed. And so one thing that I found in my web of relationships was that with my own family, uh, I had this great web of relationships. My husband, for example, was willing to take on many of the household chores that I normally took care of without complaint. And it was really wonderful. And actually, after I recovered, he has still continued to make breakfast in the morning, which is really fantastic. My kids, who are my children, my children, they're the kids that I took care of. Well, they're grown up now. They're 28 and 32 years old. And they came to my bedside. They came to me when I was recovering, took me on wheelchair rides, comforted me, reassured me. And suddenly we had sort of shifted roles within our web of relationships that they were caring for me rather than me having to take care of them. And I thought that was a really important piece of my recovery. In terms of work, my students began taking over some of the, the tasks that I was always feeling responsible for, writing the annual reports to the National Science Foundation, uh, preparing documents for a training that we might be doing. And so having this web of relationships of my professional team was also really fundamental in terms of reassuring me that my recovery was on the way. This was also true of my personal relationships, the friends that came and visited me. And I thought, I think that having this web of relationships, and, and you can think about this in terms of the disturbance that you came up earlier as we started talking, how does your web of relationships, how did your web of relationships enter in or not enter in, in terms of, of, of augmenting the capacity that you had for your, for your disturbance? Well, um, a fourth precept, was the idea of what we started calling a third state. Usually when we encounter a disturbance, we say, well, once we recover, we're gonna go back to normal. We're gonna have a disturb, we have an original state. We're gonna go through a disturbance. And then if we're successful, we're gonna come back to that original state. Well, it doesn't always work that way because what we began talking about as we began considering these different disturbances and recoveries was that in fact, it's very rare to come back to the original state. What we found was that instead we came back to a third state, then there might be another disturbance, and then to a fourth state, and then to a fifth state. And this was exemplified by some of the descriptions that our urban planner had when she was describing her research on the effects of Hurricane Kat Katrina on New Orleans. So she said, you know, the original state of New Orleans is that picture number one. Then during the disturbance, during the hurricane, Neighborhoods flooded, infrastructure failed. We all know that having seen these pictures for uh, over a decade now. And then what she said was that right now, 11 years later after Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans is not New Orleans anymore. It's not the old New Orleans. It hasn't returned to its former state. Some neighborhoods have actually improved their infrastructure and other wards like the ninth ward have actually declined. 
And so this idea of the fact that there's a third state, that we don't go back to the original state is something very important. And I remember when I was visiting my doctors, you know, after I had fallen out of that tree and was on my way to recovery, and they would say, well, Nalini, are you back to yourself? Are you back to your original state? Because to them, that would indicate success, right? That they had they had managed to fix me. And I would say, well, I'm not quite sure. In fact, I have undergone changes. Yes, I'm back to work. Yes, I'm back to climbing trees. But what I also reflected on as I was lying in the hospital, as I was wheeling around with my wheelchair and hobbling around with my walker for months and months, was that I realized that all my adult life, I've been riding what I call this bright red arrow of achievement, of the next proposal, the next paper that I could write, the next award I might get. And I was just hurrying from one to another. And it was, a, you know, it's kind of an exciting life and it's very wonderful. But what I found after my accident is that that bright red arrow began to sort of fade a little bit. And I began thinking, you know, writing another paper, getting another proposal funded, maybe those aren't the most important things to me anymore. And what I began thinking about was that maybe all of that bright red arrow stuff maybe needs to fade out a little bit in order to open up space for some new activities that are more fulfilling to me as an individual who has been very close to death and now understands that community building of people might be important. For instance, now every Monday night, my husband and I have what we call Monday home evening and we cook up a bunch of food on Sunday. We invite 15 or 20 people over for dinner and we just spend the evening talking and eating and interacting with each other and sort of building community together. And I began learning how to turn wooden bowls and it's a new relationship that I have with trees that I never took the time for before. But now I can take a block of wood from a fallen tree in my study site in Costa Rica and I can go to the Utah Arts Alliance which has a wood shop. I pay 50 bucks a month and I can go in there and use the power tools and I create these sort of really terrible wooden bowls, but I don't care because it's just so much fun to be in contact with wood and to think about the growth of that tree and how it's contributing to make a little object that I place in my home that can be of use to me. And so I feel that there's been, I'm now myself in a third state one where I retain some of the things that I used to think are important. I still love teaching. I still love doing my research. I still love doing public engagement, but I've keyed it down a little bit so that I have more time to build community and to make creative things with my hands. And so with that, what I'd like to do is to sort of throw the ball back to each of you and to think about what elements promote recovery in the disturbance that you've been thinking about. And I'll just provide the little list of the precepts that came out of our colloquium and sort of pose the question about when he, do any of these precepts that were generated by these different experts in these different disciplines, do any of those relate to the disturbance and the recovery that you articulated to yourself and to the people that you talk to? And if they do, I'd love to hear about that. And if maybe some of these are a little off or maybe you have some ideas about what promotes recovery for the disturbance that you've been involved with? I'd like to open that up for discussion now. So why don't you go back to the partner or partners that you were speaking with and take a look at these, see if they make sense to you. And then we'll, in about five minutes or so, we'll have some reporting out to see whether these make sense to your particular disturbance, number one. And then number two, are there other patterns or precepts that you can think about or you have insights on that might help us deal with recovery from our disturbances. So have at it. Good. Thank you. Uh, so I, I was just gonna I was gonna ask you about uh, system change within this model. Yes. Uh, because it, you know it's not just sort of on the surface. It's really like how does the how does the recovery and the move from the disturbance to the right. recovery actually fundamentally change the systems that right. we've been operating on. Right. Uh, but and the example that I think about in that context is really the diversity, equity, and inclusion discussions, right. right? And the fact is, you know, we can't we can't get to where we want to get to with the same system that we are operating exactly. under today. Exactly, that's right. And that's where disturbance, as our modern dancer said, you might need to change the, the system of ballet in order to get to this new world of modern dance. And so we're not going to do plies at the bar right. over and over again. We're going to be moving across the floor, leaping because 
that's what we have to do. But it changes the system of how we train dancers. Instead of being little ballerinas, they turn into little modern dancers and grow up to be big modern dancers. And, we, and so the system of dance has changed. We have, exactly. to let, we have to let go of all those expectations that yes. we had around about how the system works. Right. And, and so that's tough, isn't it? our beliefs. Right, around, right, right. right. So. Fascinating. Thank you, Kurt. Great. Thank you. In the back there, I don't know who's going to be your names. Could you just come up here and speak? Maybe we can change it so that you can face out as well. And tell me your name, too. My name is Cheyenne. Cheyenne. Okay, yes, great. Nice to meet you. Can you tell us what you talked about? Uh, well, we, we talked about a lot of things. So we talked about, um, about uh, resilience. We, we've been mm. talking about resiliency and, um, and about how within that framework of resiliency, recovery from from a disturbance, um, it be, the third state being the most important thing to acknowledge. Yes. And, and part of the third state, we were thinking in the way of having a growth versus a fixed mindset. So growth uh -huh. mindset is similar to your mindset right. where you were, we were, you have to be open. You right. have to be not attached to an outcome. It, yes. If you're attached to an outcome, you're on the red arrow, like yes. you were talking about. And the red arrow is the big you know, you're on the pathway. And if you release yourself from that yeah. pathway, all of a sudden, many outcomes become possible. Right, right. So non-attachment to outcome, I think, is an important um, attribute to have. Got it. To have resiliency to recover from. Fantastic. Disturbance. Great. Yeah. Profound. Thank you. That, that was brilliant. Thank you. Great. And yes, can you come on up? And again, I'm sorry, I don't know your name either. I'm sure. Joy, okay, great. Can you come just a little closer so that the people on Zoom can hear you too? You bet. So um, our discussion revolved around the idea of memory. Oh, wow. And um, how it seems like the memory of recovery helps assist better and maybe even more dignified recovery the yeah. next time around. It doesn't seem quite so poignant because you know you will recover mm -hmm. um, or you believe that you recover. Um, so we brought that back to the idea of forest ecology and we just wondered words like adaptation and yes. evolution are coming up, but with the idea that say you have a forest fire and all other living things scatter pretty far. Right. In the next fire, is there evidence that maybe they didn't scatter as far? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. No, no, so, that's a great question. That's a, I have to bring that back to my forest ecology. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's great. Um, how about you guys? Two personal. Two personal. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. So um, I'm Louise. Yes. Um, and I I grew up in Zion Canyon. Oh, great. So a lot of a lot of decades here. And the, the disturbance and recovery that I thought about and mentioned to my partner was um, the, the Virgin River system that is so iconic and important to Zion Canyon. The system that brings um, all of these gorgeous Fremont cottonwoods. Yes, along, fantastic trees. Along the river. And how for a, for a long time, uh, we didn't have the knowledge um, of what sustained them and made them regenerate. And so we used all kinds of artificial means, uh, rip wrapping, we called it, or gathering yes. wraps to control flooding, only to discover with a little knowledge that yeah. what causes the generation of cottonwoods are the natural disturbance right. of flash flood. And so now with the uh, knowledge uh, that that is the best thing we can do to sustain the appearance of, of the canyon and those beautiful trees that are so important to yes. us, um, maybe we can find a third state yeah. where we can recognize their value. That's fantastic. Time. Thank you, Louise. That's very wonderful. I love it. Danielle and, and your partner. Um, and tell us your name too. My name is Scout. Scout. And uh, for my disturbance, I can you just sort of face that way too so they can hear you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was just reading the yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Um, 
I have a disturbance I'm in the middle of, but I, I also recognize life is one big, one big disturbance. disturbance. Yeah. And listening to all these things, I realized that my biggest 20 years ago, I set out on a deliberate path to find more disturbance because I had become sort of stuck in I place. See. And so I've been studying this. I love wow. these questions. I love this is my, as Logan knows, I'll sit at the cafe and talk all morning. Yeah. <laughs> so my disturbance is my daughter-in-law and her daughter, four years old, are coming to live with me next week for the winter. Wow. There will be a disturbance. That's a disturbance. <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about it, it's coming from a lot of trauma in the family, I a see. lot of really, really hard stuff. I see. And it has taken all of my considerable skills to navigate this kind of condition to make it able to happen to, to make it safe enough for her to come but she came in june for just a little bit mm -hmm. because it was it really was necessary so the number one the multiple outcomes is knowing well actually this that was getting into number two knowing that there's it can be better than it is, that this mm -hmm. disturbance will create, there will be blessings, right? Right. And then the knowledge enhances recovery. And I would actually say experience yes. enhances recovery I because I can a, have all the knowledge right, in right. my head, but until I actually right. spend a month in my tiny right. place with two other, three yes. women, three generations and one. <laughs> but now we know we can do it. She's coming down and it will be completely different because there's no trepidation mm -hmm. about the foundation. Got it. Plenty of trepidation about other things. Right. None about the foundation. Fantastic. We're good. We achieved a third state in June. Now we're building on that. Fantastic. So it's just this continual third state. And the wet love groups and the wet love relationships. Right. Well, that's it. That's what you're creating and weaving. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. beautiful. That sounds wonderful. It's Let me just give you a <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And the other thing about the web of relationships is in the thing that happened Friday. Yes. I was up call up terrace. I had the, the number of people that called me to see where I was and whether no I was going on. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a we have a we've got a caller. The question and answer. Where oh, here's a question a question observation. Yeah. If there's time. My disturbance is a little bit on the nose, on June 8th, 2021, 20, the bear fire outside of Helper, yes. Utah crept uh, toward a ridge lined with a 2,600-year-old uh, 2, bristlecone pine trees. I, um, I had visited them 100 times and knew them almost as individuals. The fire burned as hot, so hot, that almost no evidence of the ancient trees remain. Scrub oak is already coming back and what does this say? Something. Oh, <laughs> it's super and, small. Yeah. And you got your glasses. And, oh, it's oh, oh, asters oh, are emerging from the ash. But this landscape is fundamentally changed. It has been hard for me to accept that a third state could come out of this because the bristle cones were symbols of deep time. So we're seeing recovery of a sort, right? We've got asters, the little tiny plants are kind of weedy plants and replacing these magnificent you know, the most, maybe the most magnificent trees on our planet, these amazingly old trees that we love so dearly. So how do we reconcile our sense of, well, this is a third state? Can we reconcile that at all? Is this what Kirk was talking about with welcoming the new structure and the new system? Or is there some loss there that we'll just have to say, we've lost those bristlecone pines? Or can we expand our sense of time the way trees help us to do and say, well, you know, to trees, 2,000 years, we'll just have to wait that long until they come back. And from, in terms of tree time and actually rock time, you know, Gary Snyder wrote this great little poem. He said, well, you know, to the rocks, the trees are just passing through, which is kind of a funny thing to think about. But maybe we need to be more rock-like in our sense of time. They're just in order to Say that again? They're just over That's <laughs> right, exactly. So that's a great question, but it means that we might have to have a more elastic sense, more flexible mm -hmm. sense of time in order to reconcile our sense of consequences of that disturbance. Wondering if there's any more, would anybody else, I know I don't want to impose on your time after this, but I'm wondering if there's anybody else who wanted to report out. Yes, Mr. Evergreen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm David, yeah, come on, my name's David Hatfield, and uh, 
I don't live here. I live in Oregon. Oh, great. And I'm a retired uh, geologist. I worked for the U.S. Forest Service for almost 40 years. So, uh, so I'm a geologist. So my sense of time <laughs> is different than a, a tree. Yeah. So um, the answer, a lot of times, is it depends. Um, you asked, what are the trees? Is yeah. that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, it depends. Uh, ecologically, it can just be part of the, uh, the way of things and the trees die um, by different causes. So it has to do with scale mm -hmm. and the periodicity of historic disturbance and the influences that, you know, what, what the influence of human beings on those trees right. over there have a problem. But the thing that I was talking about was, um, uh, so in, in the mid nineties, there was an earthquake uh, on fault near here. It caused a landslide in town. Uh, some houses were, were disturbed. Mm -hmm. um, there, there. And, um, and then there was a, uh, another movement of earth. Uh, uh, it, it moved the river, the Virgin River. It uh, took out the road that goes up into the canyon. So from a human perspective, yeah. a social perspective, that's called a catastrophe. Right. Um, to me, it's, it's like uh, public officials and humans can call things catastrophes and it's destructive, but it depends on the perspective. You know, we're not going to pollute the dirt back yeah. up there. Yeah. So you have to be resilient to the changes to our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it's scalable it's because scale. you are dealing with your scale. Right. And, and then there's, you know, scales of communities for social and then same with forests. And then, uh, you know, uh, disturbances occur, supernovas occur at those right. scales and wipe out whole solar systems. Right. So it's sort of all relative. Yeah. Uh, and it's bad if you're the thing that was on the landslide <laughs> that lived on it and it's suddenly in the water, then you'd call that a catastrophe. Right. But but a, to a wide ranging animal that has a broader ecosystem that mm -hmm. it relies upon, it's uh, it finds it, it, it can find the things that it needs in other right. places. It, that's an excellent resilient. insight. I think that's a great insight to realize that we tend to be human centered, but there are other scales, spatial and temporal scales that we can think about also. But the question I want to end yeah. with you is, uh, so all of this is disturbance recovery, but what about, uh, you know, climate change? We're looking at existential threats on global levels. So we're kind of playing small ball here, but we're, we're in the big leagues now in this. Yeah. Do you see this process helping us address this global problem, Dr. Nat Carney. I do. And I give a lot of talks. You know, I am blessed to be invited to give talks like at SEU the other day. And very often people ask me this question, well, we're facing the biggest existential problem that our planet really has ever known in terms of humans. Um, and, and many of the biota that are dependent on stable climate and so forth. So what are we to do? And and I think about this, I think that yes, there are multiple outcomes for climate change that some plants and animals and some humans actually will benefit and others will be very much harmed. And so we have to think of that spectrum of consequences that comes from the disturbance of climate change. Certainly knowledge uh, enhancing recovery is something that I as a professor and as an ecologist am always voting for because we, the more we understand climate change, the causes, the technological, the sociological, the emotional um, responses that we might make to climate change, I think is gonna help us respond to it more in a more healthy way. I think the web of relationships in terms of, you know, our response to climate change is absolutely essential. When we carpool instead of driving singly, when we uh, together come together to talk about solutions that our community or our local government can take in terms of helping nature, making nature trails more accessible in order to provide people with access to the calming aspects of nature um, and to ensure their survivability. I think the web of relationships is incredibly important. And finally, I think this idea of the third state of what will our planet be like? And we have some of the scientists you know, expertise that is using global climate change models to say how many how many degrees of temperature is it going to be that's going to drown Bangladesh or Tonga or uh, drown Miami or New York City. The more we can learn about that, um, the more we can figure out what our third the third state that we need to grow into in terms of mitigating these negative responses. So those are very general sort of interpretations of these precepts in terms of climate change. But I myself feel that 
I have been very fortunate in addressing a forest ecology question, like what are these relic trees doing in this pasture in terms of recovery? And being able to go to people in other fields, other areas of expertise, and, and people like you who may not be uh, you know, the certified neuroscientist or the urban studies person, but who have life experiences, who have experienced disturbance and, and carried out activities that lead to recovery. I think all of us have insights into some of these more general ideas that will help us mitigate the negative aspects of, of disturbance, recognize the potential positive consequences of disturbance, and then work towards activities that are going to mitigate the sort of inevitable, sporadic, unpredictable, but ubiquitous disturbances that we encounter on our planet and in our lives. So I would just invite you to think about these topics, the local ones, just you know, the ones that Logan was talking about, but these big ones that are global and planetary, really, uh, in terms of their scale, um, and to think about and share with others what your, what your ideas are about disturbance and recovery, because to me, uh, it's a part of life, part of my life, part of our lives, part of the lives of trees that I hold so dear, um, and this very planet that we live on. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts uh, to, with all of us and with each other. And I wanna thank you again, Logan and, and Danielle for this opportunity to, to learn from each other. Thanks so much.